Hey all, I'm Mike Patty with Cine Samples and Hollywood Scoring, and uh, this is the next video in, uh, in the series that we're doing to kind of showcase some of the, our friends in the music scoring community here in Los Angeles. And we're going through um, most of the orchestra instruments. And today we're going to be focusing on the violin with the great Mark Robertson. Wow. <laughs> the great Mike Patty. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I've been kind of asking really general questions at first. So okay. what is some of the, or what is the basic range of the violin? The basic range of the violin, for, uh, obviously the, the, there's four strings, as we know, and then the bottom one will start with low G, and then we can really go, I would say, that's a G, all the way up there, something like that. Um, so, right, well, yeah. what's like a comfortable, like... Yeah, that, that, I mean, people it, can do that. We don't normally play too many melodies that high. Yeah. But certainly if we're doing some effects, so we can do harmonics. You start getting into dog territory there. You wouldn't want to go too much higher than that. So how is the dynamic range across the instrument? Is it the same? Well, I think, I mean, you've done some other stuff with cello and stuff, but I think really from Niente, really, if you're just like doing some trim, you know, it can be really, really soft. It's pretty loud, triple forte, you can go as loud as really you want. So Mark, you are a concert master. Um, you've been kind of concert master in some of our sessions right. um, for League of Legends and a right. few other things. Uh, so what is that, tell us a little bit about your history with that and, and the shows you've played on and... and uh, okay, well luckily, luckily recently there's been a kind of a renaissance, if you will, of film scoring with TV orchestras in the last, let's say, 12 years or so. There's always been orchestras for TV, but then there was a little dip, and now it's back. Um, I think a lot of us started with Michael Giacchino and Lost, and continuing now with Seth MacFarlane. He has three or four shows that have an orchestra every week. Um, shows I've played on as Concertmaster uh, that are running now are uh, Perception on TNT, Revenge, which is on ABC, um, House of Cards, which is on Netflix, actually, and Revolution. Um, which is on NBC. So those are four shows that weekly use an orchestra right now that I work on. Got it. So, um, I mean, I've been fortunate to conduct a couple of orchestras for our League of Legends sessions, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's awesome to have you over here uh, to my left oh, because thanks. it's like it's kind of like you know, you're walking on a tightrope and you're the net who can help answer questions or if you lose your train of thought. Well, I think the role of any section leader, strings or winds or brass or percussion, is to sort of facilitate that relationship and facilitate a go-between. So you don't have to know 100% of everything that's going on detail-wise. Like, you know, I mean, right. as the conductor and orchestrator and composer, you've got a lot of stuff going on in your head. So sometimes the leader, leaders of each section can sort of help mitigate problems, if that's for, for lack of a better description of that. Okay, so but, what is, like, What's something that you would do? I mean, what uh, uh, that you, changes you'd make to the music? Because a lot of the stuff I've seen you do, like you just kind of you just make make the, well, the decision. And sometimes it's you can make so an executive decision and it doesn't really affect anything other than making it better. Such yeah, as a yeah. Boeing. Usually with an articulation, I would probably check with the composer or orchestrator before making a, an articulation change because that's that's more of an orchestrator's job. But but something like a Boeing or a fingering or a tone quality might be something more like if the composer says, I need this more dark, we could come up with some solution on our own to facilitate that rather than try to go through the a laundry list of possible violin techniques that they studied in school if okay. they're not a string player. Yeah. And we just sort of make a decision to try and try something and see if it works. And 99%, nine, nine, nine times out of 10, usually it, it'll solve the problem. And then if not, then we'll, we'll try something else. Right, okay. Um, Whether something's a harmonic or not, or tremolo or not, or uh, on the A string or the D string versus a higher string for a tone quality kind of thing. Yeah. So what are some of the things that um, we're kind of, I mean, our audience here are composers who, you know, they're sitting in front of their computers and their mm -hmm. keyboard and they play mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff in um, as keyboardists. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things that are easy to play on the piano that aren't necessarily idiomatic for the violin. Right. So maybe let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are um, you know, really easy to do. Let's say uh, maybe fast lines. Or, well, why don't we start with some things that are actually harder to do? Okay. And some of those things, especially when you're notating music, is to avoid augmented leaps. Like an augmented second should always be written as a minor third. Okay. A diminished, you know what I mean? Like when it looks like A to, uh, let me give, give a good example here, like C natural to D sharp, I would rather see that as a C to E flat. And this comes up a lot when sight reading 
when the intervals are hard to read, if you're going to have this music played out later by real people, try to avoid those kind. Even if it's different vertically, have it be horizontally sight readable, and that will save you a lot of time. Especially when fast, complicated sixteenth note passages. Somebody usually, is, hopefully, a string player is proofreading that part, and and that'll avoid issues. Never just avoid those issues. Like if you're programming something in, the computer doesn't know the difference. Right. It's just going to put D sharp rather than E flat, even though E flat's easier to read from C natural. Yeah, yeah, I hope that makes sense. No, that makes sense. Yeah, that's um, like a copyist kind yeah, of. Yeah, exactly. And they're usually really that. good about that. But yeah. even just one one person screws it up, you just screwed up a take. Okay. Um, but normally that's all perfect. But that's something that definitely is an issue from time to time when programming to music to live people, mm -hmm. especially if somebody's new at it. If they're just programming in, they hand it because there's not always a copyist. It's usually just the composer if it's somebody's house or a small session. Right. So that's important. Um, chords, chords that are impossible to play. Um, people sometimes don't realize the string limitations, like you can't play, if it's a two note chord, it has to be really close together. You know, I guess the biggest would probably, I could play a tenth. You know, and that would probably be it, but you're not going to have a four note chord including a tenth. Okay. You know, that would have to be divisi and things like that. Alright, so I guess that's my next question, are double stops, what are some easy to play? Well, we were talking with uh, David, yeah. like, on the cello you could do a fifth. Now, sure, I mean... Those are all six. So something six. diatonic like that is relatively easy. Um, octaves, six, thirds, thing like that. Not um, fifths though, right? No, fifths are fine. You can. All right. I don't know. And you could also do harmonic fifths as well. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, that's not a problem. Um, and you're not gonna like have a situation where you're gonna, you're not gonna, just, that's not gonna sound yeah. good orchestrationally probably to do a bunch of fifths in a row. Um, but it's not impossible to play a fifth. Now, what about some like you know, at least in the sessions that we've done, sometimes if you're doing like really our fast arpeggiated mm -hmm. or um, ostinato type stuff, uh -huh. you know, you have sometimes what thirty people or twenty to thirty. Sure, most most, all, most full budget motion pictures have between twenty eight and thirty two violins, and let's say ten and fourteen violas, eight yeah. and twelve cellos, six to ten bass players. So. Anything is gonna like if you could do things a bunch of different ways. Like let's say we take a G minor, G major. Yeah. So one of those was slurred, one of those was staccato, or you could even do ricochet, like that. Um, so even just simple articulation things can make this the sound so much different. Okay. Now what about like short stuff like spiccato? Um, sure. You know, I mean, if you're gonna write something, it wouldn't. It, uh, if you want to do it with separate bows, it probably, you know, like that. So right. yeah, the trick is always trying to get so many people to play exactly sure. on the click. Sure, and that's so. the click does help actually, believe it or not. And then again, as long as it's written clearly, people can sight read it pretty quickly. Okay, harmonics are confusing um, as far as how they're notated. I can never. Yeah, never it's really funny. Got... There's like you know, for the same harmonic, let's say this harmonic, for example. There's probably four different ways to write that so if what's you really that? want That's to be around. That's a G, G. and it's a, an octave and a, a fifth above middle C, if I'm doing my math right, because this is middle C. So sounding regular would be here, just on the E string, the G on the top of the staff, yeah. on the treble clef. But you could also write it as a natural harmonic, just or a, a false harmonic, meaning um, a C on the G string with a circle over it, with a diamond on the C line. And that's what that would look like. You could also write it regular with a circle, meaning a zero above the G as well. Okay, so you write the sound. That's the same note. You could just write the note with a circle, a zero above it, meaning harmonic. Got it. And we would know that it would be this sound. So without the, even without even figuring out the whole diamond stuff. So the note that's written is the thing is we the should sound, hear. Pitch, that's exactly the sounding pitch. All right. The sounding pitch. If you want this sound, you can you could literally write that, but just put a zero above it. And okay. We know it's a harmonic, and then we figure it out. I see. And if you want an octave higher, you could literally just keep the same G but write 8VA over it and it would sound like this. And again, we would figure it out without you notating the diamond stuff. Okay. You can do that if you know how to do it, but it's not necessary. What's the difference between natural and fake or artificial harmonics? Well, Is you could argue that... Let's go to a higher one. That one, that's not a good example, but let's go to E, for example. That's a natural harmonic playing where the E would normally be, but as a harmonic. But you can also simulate that by doing it here. Mm -hmm. So you can automatically see that it sounds, it's more open here. Okay, as a yeah, natural yeah. harmonic, 
and that's a f let's call it artificial. All right, but it's still both harmonics. But if there so. is a natural harmonic uh -huh. version, you opt for that, right? Like I think it doesn't matter. Doesn't right? really matter. Yeah. It depends on like what sound you want. You can also vibrate this. It's a little bit hard to vibrate that hard as a harmonic, as you as you can tell by my inability to do so. It's not okay. going to really work. So you would do it here. Cool, cool. But yeah, harmonics are definitely tricky, and definitely spend ten minutes with in, your favorite string player, and they can write out. I've even put on Facebook different ways to write harmonics and said, just copy and share this. Okay. This is the same note, but here's three different ways to write as a harmonic. Yeah, that's a big it, it, question it's, it's, mark. It's, everybody yeah. stumbles upon it. Unless you're a string player, it's a little dicey. Yeah. dicey. And there's nothing to be ashamed. You, know, you could just ask somebody for help. It's, okay. So that's what I would do. Now, I have a question I kind of... If I, I didn't asked, know how to engineer something, I would ask the engineer or yeah. you know, programming, I'd ask you. Something that we hear a lot in sample libraries that kind of annoys me a little bit is people love to hear the uh, this kind of portamento glissando when they're okay. playing legato lines. Okay. And it's like, it's everywhere. They like overuse it. And uh, I want to ask you. When you're saying portamento, you mean like a slide from note to note? Yeah, like, you know, um, yeah, so you're doing a, a major seventh and right. you just kind of, you know, add a little bit of a so major seventh to it. Yeah. Okay. You know, mock-ups and stuff, and mm -hmm. samples, people mm -hmm. overuse it. How oh, often do you add those slides? Well, it's funny you mention that because it's, it's not very often that there's a reason to slide unless it's a really romantic thing or it's for comic effect. Okay. In most circumstances, we're not going to be sliding from note to note because that would just sound silly. Okay. But certainly if there's something funny on screen and they're saying, can you come up with some way to make it, let's say the movie Cats and Dogs, for example, one or two, which I, which I played on, both had some funny comic effects, uh, you know. Right. Things like that where there was glissandi for a reason. Right. But not just randomly. But like I don't, just I don't for standard good... kind of performance, you know. It's, uh, yeah, we don't normally slide that not... much. It kind of sticks out too much in the in composer. I'm just trying generally. to prove my point. <laughs> Compo <laughs> like... To who? To, to, to people that overuse that uh, technique. Well, Here, yeah. It's kind of straight from the, the violinist. Yeah, I, what I, like I can say from my experience that the composers generally don't want a lot of portamento unless okay. there's, like I said, again, a very romantic scene where like 30 people doing it together. The violinist does sound nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But only on specific pitches and used tastefully. Uh, kind of. Used tastefully, I think yeah. it's a good, good thing to use. All right, talk to us a little bit about uh, the different kinds of bowings. Yeah, you guys were asking about bowings and articulations, and as I referenced earlier, sometimes if someone's unsure, that's something you can literally talk about on the stand maybe before the, before the session starts. If you're like, hey, how should I notate this or, or, or something, uh, as there's many different ways to play the, 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 the example I did before. <laughs> Just right there, and there's three or four different ways to notate something. And on the, on, the, on the page, you could write spiccato. You could write marcato. You could write um, just legato with a slur, and then it would... I see. And I think it's pretty clear just from the, the slur or non-slur, and you could even just write bouncy. You could write adjectives, and it's, people do that all the time. Sounds like this, you know. Okay. I think that's okay to be clear especially depending on whoever's maybe writing, maybe they don't have the musical knowledge in front of them without a book to say it. You could literally look it up. Um, I'm sure there's you know, websites that describe all 100 kinds of bowing techniques and then with examples. And I want it to sound like Beethoven six, third movement or second movement or something. Mm -hmm. And that could help too. Oh, yeah. Do you remember this piece? I want it to sound in the tone of that style, like Rachmaninoff, Mozart. If you wanted it to sound like Mozart, it would sound something like this. <laughs> Like a very classical feel versus like, like yeah. more of a romantic or more, let's call it anti-classical for now. Okay. There isn't a lot of that kind of music in films at this point. They don't, they don't do much of that kind of Baroque kind of style or a classical kind of style. What is Lore? I've heard that term. I'm not really quite sure. What Lore, you know, I would sort of define as like 
I would think of it as more of a round kind of like. And it's also a dance, I believe, because in Bach there's okay. a Lure. The, the reason I ask that question is because there's a lot of composers that always ask, hey, you know, there isn't a sample library that has Lure. So as far as bowing and, and notating bowing and slurs, right. I mean, uh, it's different than notating uh, legato for like a woodwind instrument. It's just kind of telling them when to breathe kind of thing. But Sure, how, we don't have to necessarily follow those conventions. However, I think natural breaks and natural bowings as a unit work. And then there's other cases such as Barber's Adagio for Strings where it's actually going to be in staggered bowing and people will change at different times to see, make it seem more seamless, mm. to make it to sound more seamless. And that happens in film music a lot too, where if it doesn't have to, it's not a concert. We don't have to have uniform bowings. It's not aesthetically necessary to have everybody do the same thing. Yeah, bowing. I've always wondered that because I've never seen a session, well, it's, it's rare that everyone's perfectly playing. Well, exactly it depends the, on the part. It doesn't, in my opinion, yeah. it doesn't have to be aesthetically perfect for it to sound good. You know what I mean? If people's bowings work better for them in a certain place where it's complicated, uh, f uh, how do you say, note-wise, yeah. if they can figure out, or rhythm-wise, if they do it a better way, their own way, that's fine. Yeah. As long as the rhythm's right and it sounds the same, the bowing is not as important as it would be if, if we were playing a symphony on stage and it needs to be very uniform. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. There's an emphasis on how it sounds more than... Right, absolutely. If, you, if somebody in a different part of the section or the violin section wants to do a, a different bowing because it's easier for them, mm. that's their prerogative, as long as it sounds right. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to look uniform. I mean, if people are playing a long melody and they're staggering the bowing, I think that's good because that means they're using the bow as they see fit to make the best sound. Okay. Uh, then, okay, I have another question sure. about sort of the studio environment right. and clicks and that sort uh -huh. of thing. So uh, a lot of the times, these days, at least on the sessions that we've done, we're playing against um, existing kind of mock-ups and right. synth tracks. Um, what is the kind of thing that you like to hear in your ear? What is it to make a, like, to make a really efficient session? What well, I can, I can tell you this. The people that we work with generally have the same, what you're talking about, even for a film or TV show, because everything's mocked up. Video games, too. Everything's mocked up. There's click. There's pre-records. If the pre-records are going to stay, let's say there was sample strings or sample percussion or something, I think it's important for us to hear that stuff, mm -hmm. to tune to it. If there's sample mallets or sample piano, if everything's going to be replaced, we don't necessarily need to like hear stuff except for click. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing stuff in stages, it might be helpful at least the first run through to hear everything, then we turn it off. And click is fine. Um, if the like the piano, let's say the piano was pre-recorded, real piano, but it would be good to hear that if it's going to stay. Anything fixed. It's going to stay. I would leave in yeah. for whatever stems you're delivering for us to hear at the session. Okay. And everyone click, usually they bring their own head. Like their uh, own I would say 25% of people bring their own headset, but most people don't. Okay. Meaning at least 75% do not bring their own headset, and that's for the whole orchestra. I think the percussion has their own setup with the wireless stuff. Yeah. Um, a lot of the violinists I know have their own headset, but it's not a. Nothing. It's not. I mean, they're not expensive anymore. At Location Sound, they're 995 now. The little ones. So uh, let's take some questions from the internet. I have a question from Simon from Tucson, and he says, uh, I've always wondered about fast runs and arpeggios. Are there some runs significantly more difficult than others, and is there anything I should avoid when writing them? That's a good question. I, I, I would say, diatonically speaking, keeping it simple like that would make it a lot easier to play fast and also yeah. to get it recorded fast. If you're going to do arpeggios, obviously arpeggios... <laughs> Keeping it in the key is going to go a lot faster than having all sorts of intermingling notes in the middle. Right. That being said, we probably wouldn't slur the faster ones. You know, a, a, a patterned run like that would be fine too, but um, I would try to keep arpeggios and all of that just kind of laying more uh, as diatonic as possible to keep it. Okay, uh, what about fast like scalar runs? Uh, is there anything that's difficult? You know. Well, it's, you know, the faster you go and the more notes there are, it's going to be more difficult. That, yeah. that being said, anything is possible with practice. But trying to keep it within the, the, the scale mm -hmm. um, and not adding too many uh, accidentals in there is going to make, like, if you have a, a, right. a, a run of 12 notes but, and make it all C minor except for two notes in the middle, usually we're just going to rewrite some of that anyway because it's not going to be heard. 
<laughs> you just need to get, get as many in there as you can in the time allotted. Because sometimes people will put 17 notes in a quarter note <laughs> span and be like, you can do that, right? I mean, not really. So we'll eliminate six of them okay. or something. Kind of and they won't even it. know. They won't even know. It's not faking. We'll just eliminate just the f some of the notes in the beginning or the end, right. depending on where it's landing. And then most of the time... Because it's more like the, the effect that you're going yeah, for. Yeah, it's anyway. the effect you're going for, but yeah. sometimes they don't know how many is going to work in that tempo. And sometimes the tempo changes, to be honest with you. We did one movie where we recorded the same cue 12 different times at 12 different tempos. It was all whole notes, but they were literally figuring out what the at picture at the same I won't say what movie it was, literally trying to figure out at the same time what worked best with the picture, which is something they should probably do before they get into the scoring stage because it's very expensive. Right. This was 13 years ago, so uh -huh. it doesn't happen as much now. Usually it's all figured out to save money. But doing the same cue over and over again at different temples at the stage, that's, that's a waste of money. Okay. All right, here's a question from Twitter. Okay. At Wilkes asks, what is an instrument-specific technique that you wished composers would use more often? Oh, well, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that using the mute is actually a very good technique to, like, change the timbre of a sound. Mm. Like for example, I mean people do use mutes plenty, but there's always room to plug the mute more. Mm. So if it, for example, if you know we're having a little line like I played that without the mute, but let's put the mute on. It automatically just sounds like now we have a lullaby for some reason, mm. you know, and that's, that's a pleasant way to use the mute. There's also a way to make it dark, you know. We do this now. All I think right. it changes it a lot. This yeah. is a little, this kind of literally cost one dollar. They're also, we also lose them a lot, but yeah. literally one dollar for that. And I think it makes a big difference and people should use it more. Um, That's one thing. And, uh, and another, another technique people could use more is, is uh, uh, sol ponticello, which is going to the bridge. If you remember Lost, which I played on a lot of those episodes, there was a lot of stuff that was like... Yeah. And if that wasn't sol pon, it would sound like this. I think right. that sounds really cool. It adds an air of History. ominous, ominousness. Hmm. That's a word. So in a session, say there's a, you know, an issue with intonation or something like that, mm -hmm. um, what's the best way, the most efficient way, because time is money mm -hmm. uh, in these scenarios, what's the best way to get what you need and make the correction? From the composer standpoint? From, from the composer or orchestrator standpoint, yeah. Um, well, as players, we try not to get involved with, with sections that aren't that are ours specifically, but let's say there was a violin issue in 32 violins and there was something out of tune, I would say, hey, do you mind rehearsing this? Maybe it was a fast section or something. Let's, let's rehearse this a little under tempo mm. and isolate the issue and, and whatever it is will usually resolve itself. Or if it's a winds or brass thing, you would just rehearse those instruments and either the composer or maybe the orchestrator would, would be able to tell. Or maybe the section within themselves can figure out, just by doing it alone, how to adjust to make it perfect. And that's something they can do on their own sometimes, or maybe the conductor can help, like, bring it up here, bring this down, perfect. And this happens in symphony orchestra rehearsals, too. You have, to re you have to remember that when we're coming to an orchestra session, it's not a set orchestra. Almost every day, it's somebody's different. Even with League of Legends, if we did two days of calls, it wouldn't be the exact same orchestra in most cases, unless the call was put out two months in advance, and even then, stuff comes up. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, everybody's getting used to playing each other for the first few minutes. Um, and if something's particularly hard, it might take a little fine tuning with the section to make it perfect. That being said, you know, we usually get it very fast. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely not. So like, yeah, for yeah. a really difficult section, I mean, what's the ideal procedure? You know, I, I, we never know. And like, again, well, should we be rehearsing this? One thing or, you, yeah. can re you can rehearse things under tempo with click. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's a fast string passage. Just rehearse it under tempo with click. With click. With click. Okay. So like you slow, you just give a wild click at maybe three-fourths the tempo or, you know, Seven eighths of the tempo going up, whatever, and practice that section isolated. Right. While everybody else sort of looks at their part quietly, and then if there's a part, if the winds or brass needs to practice something, then you do that, and then you put it all together. 
So with click, so what I think with click, sometimes it's quicker just to you know because they have to assemble a click in the in the booth and stuff. Can you well, do it maybe, on the stick? Well, maybe maybe not. Maybe maybe not. If it's just like we need a click at eighty two, they can give you that wild. They could, yeah. yeah. That's true. If I know the if the tempo is one hundred and sixty really fast, we could do it at half tempo first and just build it up. Right. Um, I don't think that that's usually not a problem. Okay. Just ask for click wild at whatever tempo you want to do yeah. it at. Do and um, what? Just like run through it three or four times. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and then, then each then time like get a little faster. A little faster, and then that's that's what I. I mean, in a, in a symphony orchestra rehearsal, if there's a fast passage in Shostakovich or something, they're going to rehearse it under tempo, and obviously there's no click, mm -hmm. but they're going to rehearse it slow, slowly, and then they'll get better each time they do it. Got it. And that's that's what I would say is just isolate, rehearse. Okay. So do you, yeah, so rehearsals are important. I, Absolutely. I think there's a tendency to just Remember, like, everybody's sight reading. Everybody, everybody's and, sight know, reading. Yeah. And as fast as we are, there's going to be some passages that are not sight readable. That's nothing to be ashamed of. Right. Everybody needs to practice and needs time to run through something. And you, again, after a couple of takes, it's usually perfect, and then you move on, especially in television where you don't have a lot of time. Right. You asked before about minutes of music, um, and I think you know three to five minutes an hour is very safe. With Revolution specifically and Revenge, we're getting done, you know, five to six minutes an hour, easy. Mm. Because TV, it's fast. Yeah, we yeah. play it once, rehearse it, and then take it, maybe take a safety take, and it's perfect by that point and we move on. But that's a testament to the Los Angeles musicians and how fast uh, we are, and also the copies, copying and orchestrating, everything's perfect to right. a T when it's this kind of deadlines. There's no time for mistakes, mm. so. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, Mark. That was, uh, that was really helpful. Thank you for having Me. us. Um, all right, well, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you for the next video. See you soon.